So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, I came earlier today and was listening in on many of the technical talks. And I realized that what I had in mind was probably a little too simple for this audience. So, you're going to be talking about things that are, uh, that are fairly uh, com complicated technically. But one reason for it is pretty much all that I know. And the other is because I wanted to put certain thoughts in your mind. Uh, about some of the work that you're doing with, or we are doing uh, with respect to machine learning and uh, the fundamentals of it. So this is not a technical talk. Its purpose is more to raise questions than to provide answers. I will, again, keep it as brief as possible and then open the floor for questions. Um, if you don't want to ask any questions, I'll just keep talking. But I advise you that's probably not a good idea. So let me begin with an example. This is from Anscom, uh, who was an American statistician. And it's an example that many of you have probably seen. So apologies for, for repeating this to some of you. But the basic idea is, is what I want to follow up with. This is a data set. It's a data set. It's a small num few observations. It's got a Y associated with it, and it's got an X associated with it. You can think of it as an input, and you can think of it as an output. Put whatever variables you want to on it. You know, height, weight, uh, prices, and suppliers willing to sell at that price, whatever you'd like. And when you have a data set of this kind, typically the kind of models that we build is we build an equation. And if you build an equation on this, you might end up with an equation that looks like that. Y is equal to 3 plus half x. That's called a linear regression. And it has what's called an R square of 0 0.67, 67%. What that means is 67% of the variability of the data is of variability of y is explained by x. And that's an equation. This is a procedure. This is the way model is typically built. We have all learned how to do that. And there's nothing particularly surprising about this. Here's another data set. This data set is again on x and y. Actually, if you remember the numbers or recall the numbers, it's the same x and y that we had seen before. And you can again build a similar model figuring out what this is. And the model in this particular case, OK, this is stuck a little bit. Where do I point? And the model is this. This is 5 plus half x with an R square of 67%, hmm. which is what we would typically do, building a regression model through a data set when we see it. This is Anscombe's third data set. And it's a data set that similarly is on the same x's and y's. It's apparently got a nice line, line going through it. And again, when you get a data set of this kind, you build a model around it. You run a function, a regression function if you want to. And you get an equation. And that equation is 3 plus half x with an R square of 67%. Um, you may have another data set. This is slightly different. And again, if you see a data set of this kind and you're not entirely sure what the data set is about, think of a database and you've got x columns and you've got, you've got x variables and y variables. And if you plot them out, they look like that. And again, you can build a regression model and it'll be 3 plus half x with an R square of 67%. Right. Now, what you've done is you've taken four different data sets and you've built what you thought of was four different models. Now, do you believe that these models are correct? So, as somebody once said, a statistician once said that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Right? Do you think these are useful? What I've done is I've just followed a standard procedure to do that. Now, what I've demonstrated, of course, is in terms of linear regression, but this can happen for anything. This can happen for a neural network. This can happen for random forests. This can happen for support vector machines. This can happen for whatever your favorite modeling poison is. What that means is that if you give different data sets with different kinds of aspects to the data set, you might end up with similar models which begs the question as to what exactly is the model doing? Which begs the question as to what is it that you want the model to do? Now, one of the things that you might ask, given, given this example that I showed, is that if you were given a data set and wanted to avoid the challenge that I just showed you, what would you do? And we often assign this to students or others as, as an exercise as to what would you do? How would you take care of things, for example, like noise? 
How would you take care of things like nonlinearity? How would you take care of things like outliers? How would you take care of things like stratified data? Can you come up with a procedure in which such a thing is automated? Or is model building a manual process? And if it is a manual process, then as machine learning specialists, how do we deal with this? So therefore, this is a technical challenge. This is also to some extent an, an understanding issue as to try and figure out, to go back to the question, as to what a model is supposed to do and what a model is supposed to accomplish. Now, in case you're, as I said to repeat, in case you're thinking I'll never build something as simple as a, as a linear regression model, this is not an aspect of linear regression model at all. This dynamic could happen in a variety of data sets. This is just a simple way of illustrating it. So, to begin the modeling process, the questions that we often typically ask is, and you have asked this in your industry, is that what is it that you're trying to do? What is it that the model is trying to accomplish? You might argue that I am not in the business of model building at all. I'm in the business of prediction, saying who will buy my product? What is the best price offer? Is this positive sentiment or negative sentiment? Is this the image of a cat or a dog? What is the forecast of revenues? Hmm. That might be your problem. Your problem may not be the problem of building a model. Unfortunately, what's, what has happened is that whichever route, route we choose, we end up building and fitting a model. And I want to talk about a couple of ways of, that this is done uh, in the hope of eliciting from you some response as to how do you see this in your industries and what might be a way of going about it. One of them is very relevant to, to what this workshop is about, uh, which is machine learning itself. The other is not. Now, this issue of, of getting knowledge out of data is old. Many fields have done it. Many fields have make it their profession. I'm trained as a statistician. Um, in fact, for a long time, my, my card, if I had a card, said statistician or, or whatever my faculty appointment was. And then at some point, I was advised that I should use the term data scientist. And so my card became data scientist. And, and then I realized that, that I wasn't a data scientist because some assumptions were being made on me that if you're a data scientist, you need to be good at this, that, and the other. So I went online and I tried to figure out what a data scientist was. Uh, like all of you, I probably found an explanation in that a data scientist is a statistician who works in Silicon Valley. <laughs> now, I, I've never worked in Silicon Valley, but I was a student there many years ago. I have a rough idea of what that culture is, and I knew right off the bat that I'm not a statistician working in Silicon Valley. Right? That second competency isn't necessarily there. Uh, so therefore, and, and, and these are things done in, 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 in R, and uh, actually my programming skills are not so much in R as in S, uh, which is I, where I first learned to code much of this. So, but the point of that is to say that modeling and model building has come from many traditions mathematical traditions, statistical traditions. And I want to talk about two particular traditions today. Uh, on computing, computer science, that side of it, and in economics and in social sciences and that side of it. And to build a little bit of a contrast as to how these two communities tend to see this and why they see it a little differently and what lessons we might have going forward. One of them obviously is a story that you know and probably know a lot better than I do. The other is possibly also that but maybe a little alien to this forum, but I want to spend roughly an equal amount of time on both. Both computer science and statistics have many awards that are given. Uh, the two major awards that are given in these fields, the Turing Award in Computer Science uh, and the Swedish Riksbanks Award or the Nobel Prize in Economics, and they're given across those fields. They're given across in computing, this has gone for compilers, this has gone for languages, this has gone for many in innovations and inventions in the field. In economics, it's gone for micro, for macro, uh, for econometrics, for development, for finance, for many areas. Perhaps coincidentally, or perhaps not, last year when these awards were given, both the Turing Award and the Riksbank Award had a strong data feel to it. The people who won this award, the Nobel laureates in those corresponding fields, were in many ways advanced versions of data analysts. And they were also model builders. 
So what I want to do is take you a little bit through their journey and how they thought of the world and how they thought of a model. And I think it gives insights as to the kind of questions that we often, we often deal with. So the first is the Turing Award. And many of you probably have followed this. So the Turing Award was given to three scientists, Lacoon, Hinton, and Bengio, for their work on deep learning. Uh, deep learning, uh, irrespective of what that terminology means, is something very, how would I say, well-defined. And the work that Bengio, Hinton, and Lacoon did over the years has tended to focus on certain kinds of neural network architectures, things like convolutional neural networks and, and uh, recurrent neural networks, and certain very specific applications where they have turned out to be extremely useful. Applications like computer vision, speech recognition, NLP, robotics, and many of the sessions that are happening today are about these things. So when this became, of course, well understood and deep learning became implemented, a whole generation of people, certainly my generation, started asking as to what's new about this. How is it different from the models that were built before? Neural networks have been built for quite some time. Um, I learned neural networks, and the first thing I was taught is, from my community, that a logistic regression is a neural network with no hidden layers. And now you go from there. You had a, add a hidden layer, you get a perceptron, you add more complexities, you get other things going forward. So the question became that, that those things worked. They, they, were, they had theories behind them. Um, the neural networks were universal approximation classes. What that meant is that if you've got even one hidden layer, but you're willing to have arbitrarily many nodes, then pretty much any function could be learned as well as you want. That led to a lot of good theories like pack learning and all of that. But something fundamentally changed when deep learning came through, and the kinds of problems, for example, things with handwritten recognition and all of that, saw a, a, almost a quantum jump in the improvement. So obviously scientists here started asking that what is different in the model? What is it that is making this particular model tick? Unfortunately, this is a question for which no clear answer yet exists. No one quite knows why this is working. Very important people are working on this issue. The Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton has set up a year-long program trying to figure this out. Many award winners are trying to figure out that is what the mathematics, what the logic of deep learning um, is and how it works. That it works is not being challenged. And like many models before it, the first is that it works, and then is you figure out why it works. And, and what happens to it, and, and theory behind it. Gauss came up with linear regression, you know, 1804, 1805, predicting the, the trajectory of Ceres, which is an asteroid. He said that this is data from an asteroid, and he used a linear regression type model to say that this is the forecast of where the asteroid will be. You will see it here. That was an innovation in astronomy, it was also an innovation in modeling, saying that to use something like a linear regression from it, you can argue as to whether linear regression came first and the normal distribution came first or the other way around. Historians aren't particularly clear. But whatever it is, Gauss came up with it. Now, why linear regression then be is a good thing to do took quite some time. Uh, you know, about 70, 80 years before Galton came up with the principle and in fact named it regression. And then maximum likelihood theory came forward and said that this is why it works. And then machine learning pretty much came and said that, no, I don't like it. That isn't why it works. R square makes no sense. Whether a model works internally or not doesn't matter. Let me do test and training. So let me figure out a different modeling understanding of this and see how it works. So different fields have developed it over a period of time. Even simple models take a long time to get there. And in deep learning, this is sort of where we are. That we know that it works, but we don't quite know why it works. Now the difficulty of why not knowing why it works is that we can't build a theory for it. So we do not know what the next development of it might be. And its foundation and we, its founders have been giving many lectures on this, mathematicians, computer scientists, various levels of technologists, electrical engineers, etc., figuring out what this means, including theories of, of, um, of intelligence that might come out of this. Now at a crude level, the kinds of things that these models do is not very complicated to explain in the sense that the what of deep learning is not necessarily very hard once you've hacked the code a little bit, and I'm sure many of you have. 
So for example, let's suppose that you take an image, this is an image, and from that image, you want to extract an outcome that essentially says this, a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand. The input is that image, the output is that piece of text. This is from a nature review paper by Lacoon and others, the, the three authors. And Nature, as you know, is a, is a paper for scientists. Most of its papers are from biology, from the life sciences, from medicine. And the authors of deep learning people have said that, can you write about it? Because this is so exciting, um, maybe you want to tell scientists as to what this is. So they wrote a paper in Nature, and you, you, in your free time, please go and look it up. I think it's a wonderful summary uh, for those like me who don't have an in-depth understanding of the mechanics of it. But what they talked about in that and in many other places, how do you go from an image that looks like this into an output that looks like that? And what is, what is the modeling that goes behind this? What are the different pieces that need to fit in? The second part, the language part, I won't talk about too much, although it's just as possible to talk about that. The vision part essentially dictated the fact that at the lower level or the early levels of a convolution neural network, it was essentially modeling what images do. So for example, it, it's trying to model that there are, there are straight lines and there are curves and there are segments and there are things like that. I mean, that's a particular segment. In order to be able to get to the idea of people, it needs to recognize that there are people here, that this is a people, so boundaries are needed, hmm, that maybe there's a hat. So I need to have a, a model for a curve. Now, if you look at the hat on the top of uh, this young person's head, now that's a curve. Now, you might ask the question that if that is the curve, is that curve any different from, let's say, this curve? Now, that's also a curve. That's a curve to which we fit a linear model that we weren't particularly happy with. So one way to think about that is that if you can build models of curves, you can build models of segments. Which is the way, for example, when I learned computer vision the first time with snakes and segments and things like that. Those of you who have been working on imaging probably know that, but today we don't use snake algorithms and things like that for segmentation. So the fact that you can model a curve doesn't necessarily mean that the traditional way of modeling a curve is going to work in this particular scenario, which is the scenario that the deep learning folks were working with. So they said that, okay, we need to build a model of a curve. And if I want to do it using something like, let's say, a polynomial regression, then what might be the problem associated with doing that? How many equations might I need? Uh, and the, it goes down a fairly traditional way of doing um, uh, image analysis, and you end up with things like differential equations that have optimal solutions using energy minimization. And the 80s and the 90s and even up to 2000s papers were full of that kind of image analysis. But that model, that way of modeling, ran out of space, so to speak. Computationally, ran out of space. And the real innovation behind this was the fact that, no, that is not the way I understand what a curve is. The way I understand what a curve is, I basically put a filter on it. I basically say that if I multiply certain numbers along a straight line, say I go, you know, minus 1, minus 1, 5, minus 1, minus 1, or I do minus 2, 7, minus 2, etc. I go left and right, I go top and bottom, I go around the square, and I can figure out that if I take averages of data, then at the end of it, magically, what will appear is a curve, despite the fact that I've never actually written the equation of a curve, which is what a convolution kernel is. It's a way to recover a curve without writing a polynomial down. But if you do that, now things become interesting. Because now you can say that, what can I do to that matrix? What can I do to that kernel to help it recover all kinds of shapes that I'm interested in? And now we're cooking with hot gases, as they say. Because I can play this trick not just for curves, but I can play this trick for anything. I can play this trick for vegetables that aren't curves. I just need to know what trick to play. Which means what they did is they solved the problem that I began with rather interestingly. So the initial problem that I began with saying is that if you've got a data set, and it has the possibility of things being curved and things having outliers and things having breaks, then how do I build a model that somehow takes care of all of that? Well, the solution to that problem, so to speak, is, is this kind of kernel approach, or what in support vector machines we would call the kernel trick. What Vapni called the kernel trick, a very useful trick that sort of says that by doing clever additions and multiplications, I can get all kinds of nonlinearities expressed. It's a trick. I don't need complicated functions. I just need the kernel trick. And this is a grown-up version of that kernel trick, applied repeatedly over and over again. 
Computers are good at that. If you say, keep doing something over and over again, they like it. Don't be sophisticated about it. Apply this kernel once, do a little bit of pooling, apply it again, do another bit of pooling, apply it again, do some subsampling, keep doing this. The cleverness is not in the kernel. The cleverness is when to use the kernel. So effectively, what they did is they said that I'm going to build a model by building out all these little complicated pieces and having one simple trick being repeated over and over again. So that's their understanding of what a model is. Now, is it a good model? It's an exceptional model for what it's trying to do, which is understand an image. And similarly, it's an, the, 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 the RNN version of it or the LSTM version of it is an exceptional model for understanding text. But what does it mean to say that a model is excep exceptional? In deep learning or in machine learning or in AI in general, a model is considered to be very good if it predicts well. In other words, if you give it a new image, it'll give you the right answer. It doesn't care about the equation. It doesn't care about the rule. All it cares about saying is that if you put this in, you get the right answer. For the MNIST data set, when they said that we now have, let's say, 2%, 3% error, whatever the right answer is, that's all people cared about. They didn't really say, what is the model that went into this? They said, wow. And I've been trying to do this for donkey's years and nothing's happened. And now these people come and give me this. Right? First believe, then do something with it. The model is baked in. But the model has a pure advantage. And the pure advantage that the model has is that it doesn't have to exist as a model. It never needs to be stated as a model. Right? We don't ask the question of the deep neural networks that can you take care of outliers? It's an entirely reasonable question to ask. Now, we may say that, okay, if there are too many outliers, the learning rate is going to go down and the misclassification rate is going to go up and et cetera, et cetera. So outliers will manifest itself. But the model doesn't need to adapt to any obvious mathematics that takes care of the difficulties of the kinds of models that a regression is struggling with. So this is effectively what, mm, mm, what deep learning's view of modeling is. Now, some months after that, the Nobel Prize for Economics, the Rick Spang Prize for Economic Sciences, or the equivalent Nobel Prize, went to Banerjee Dufla and Kramer for their work in development economics. And this work, quite unrelated, obviously, to the machine learning world, but I might put, draw some lines at the end, it takes a very different view to what a data set might be asked to do. So what Banerjee and Dufla and others did is they said that we want to reduce poverty in the world by understanding where poverty comes from. How did they go about doing this? So they went about doing this is to say that I don't want to have a great overarching theory of poverty. Many people have tried that. That's not working for us. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask certain very specific, smaller, precise questions. Do people go to school if I give them these incentives? Do people get vaccinated if I, if I do this policy? Specific questions are asked of the data. Well, they're not actually asked of the data. They're asked. And then what they did is they went out and they got the data. So they said that, OK, what data is going to allow me to answer this particular question? And what they did is they then designed the experiment to get the data to answer the question. Now, the kind of data that they often end up with is quite different from before. Here's an example from, uh, from a paper uh, by Banerjee Duflo and several others in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Uh, simple enough to read if you're keen to read this kind of literature. And what they're talking about here is they're talking about difference in test scores. They looked at language and they looked at math. They've looked at multiple parts of the world. This data is from Haryana and from Uttar Pradesh. And effectively, what they're asking is a question that says this that if I have a policy in place, so for example, teaching at the right level, which is something that uh, they were working with Pratham, which is an NGO in India, to implement. And they said that if I do this, then do I see a difference in language and math scores? Hmm. And they found out that, yes, in Haryana, um, language made, sort of the language test score improved significantly if I taught at the right level, but the math did not, which is a finding which is a finding. Is there a model here? Yes. There's obviously a model here. But this model has not been built the same way that the deep learning model has been built. 
This model to some extent has been built backwards. It's been built with the premise that give me a number that I'm interested in. And the number that they're interested in is, let's say, the gain in my skill level due to this program. Now they say embed this number into a model, into an equation. That may depend on many things. The procedure that they use is something called difference in differences. So what they say is, let me begin with everything on the right level, and let me say that here's, here's a set of schools, and here's another set of schools, and I'm going to baseline them. And then one set I'm going to teach with a new procedure, one set I'm not. Let me look at the difference, past and pr present, before and after the intervention. That's one difference. And the other is, let me look at the difference between the two, those who receive the treatment and those who are different. A difference in difference approach. And so they built out a model. Now, this model, the way that model is parametrized, is done very differently from the way a deep learning model is built. Why? It's not that they were asking a question very different. It's just that they were understanding the interpretation of it very differently. So, for example, if you are asked a question of the following type, um, will my social media campaign increase my retention rate or, let's say, reduce my churn rate? So you have a churn rate in your company, and you're running a social media campaign. Did it work? Now, what would be the, shall we say, the banerjee Duflo way of doing it? They would say that, very good. Let's take that parameter. Let's figure out how to measure it. Let's now give campaigns to some. Let me not give campaigns to others. And let me try and figure out whether there is a provable difference. What would be the deep learning way of doing this? Take the text, parse it, use that text to figure out whether I can identify the people who have churned or not. Which is the, model, the kind of model that probably many of you have built, a sort of a churn predictor kind of model. Both of these are going to solve similar problems. Hmm. So now, why is there this difference? One reason there might be this difference is because the two, the two groups, the two communities, approach this differently. Unlike the prediction approach that, say, computer science takes, economics takes a prescriptive approach. It says, my objective is not to build the model. My objective is to figure out how I should teach. Not to predict whether you have learned, but to figure out how I should teach you. That's a very different objective. In marketing, you can have a similar thing. My objective is to figure out how to sell to you, not whether you will buy or not, which is the predictive approach. So sitting inside this, there is a predictive approach to modeling, and sitting inside this, there's a prescriptive approach to modeling. And two highly competent groups in two different fields have taken two different tracks to doing this, and how you would figure this out. Now, we tend to approach one or the other of these based on our education, based on our training. If you're trained in software, if you're trained in, in, in engineering, in computer science, any of that, the first approach seems very obvious, and the second seems fake. If you're trained in statistics and economics, the second approach seems obvious, and the first one seems fake. Depends on your background. Some of you, I think, may have come from a statistics, economics kind of background, and have taught yourself software, and presumably are good at it. Some of you have come from a programming background and are now teaching yourself things like models and equations and how that works, depending on how you define the data science animal, as I said. But I want to leave you with the, with, with the thought that whichever side of the world that you come from, you are building models. And the kinds of questions that you're asking is going to drive the kinds of models that you will build it will also drive the kind of skill sets that we need to collectively develop. Tying this in to some extent to what I do, so I work for great learning and upskilling, and one of the things that I think about, not necessarily as a part of my job, but even otherwise, is that where is the, what is the skill that needs developing? Hmm. So I've taken one journey through that, is to say that these are the possible ways of looking at the model building exercise, and now figure out what is the methodology for dealing with this. And if I go back to the simple linear regression problem, how might you do this? One way to do this might be to say, let me figure out a way in which a linear regression model is parametrized 
so that things like non-linearities and things like outliers can be automatically identified, which would be the deep learning way of doing things. The econometrics way of doing it would be, give me a parameter that talks about this problem and this problem and this problem, and let me figure out a hypothesis to see whether that problem is there or not. And then go ahead and figure out a solution to this problem. And how would you do it? So there's no right or wrong answer to any of this. And as I said, all models are wrong. All predictions are wrong. Some predictions are useful. Hmm. The better your predictions are, the better you presumably get paid. Hmm. But similarly, all prescriptions are wrong. The proof of the prescription being correct is what happens at the end of the day. So even in our worlds, when we deliver a marketing uh, solution, or a finance solution, or an HR solution, an LP solution, it will be executed in the real world, and people will come back and say, did this prescription work? And so the proof of it will be in that, in the policy of all of that. And as you're probably in your careers, you've figured out that it's not about the equation. It's not about the model. It's about, did it make a difference in your company's bottom line? And does that come from prediction or prescription or any of those things? So that's sort of all I had, just to give you a, a, a perspective of, of two different communities and link it back to a very old-fashioned uh, old way of doing things. I'm going to stop here, solicit questions if you have any. If not, I might say a little bit more and then stop. Over to you. Anything come to your mind? Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, you still raise a question on what is really a model. Yes. I, I think. Yes. I so, what, so what is a model? So a model is an abstraction of reality. It is a way to represent what is happening in the world or in the universe. Now, the easiest way to do that is by writing an equation. But it's not the only way to do that. Hmm. So for example, in the early generation of neural networks, it says that wh why were neural networks thought about? This is the input that I'm getting to the brain. And let me write an equation, put it into a sigmoid, and say that a series of cascading, activating sigmoids is where, where ideas come from. And people said, no, 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 no. There's plasticity in the brain and all of that. That's not the, a model for intelligence. So scientists, social scientists, natural scientists, are always trying to understand things in terms of models. The current thinking in deep learning is a debate. Is, is it a model of intelligence? Because if deep learning is a model of intelligence, it is the way we actually think, then this is a remarkable breakthrough. It means that we have now figured out how humans think. On the other hand, if it is not a model of human intelligence, it's a better neural network. And we'll come up with a better one 10 years from now. Hmm. So model is an abstraction. It's a way we understand what it works. Now, that may be a mathematical statement. Sometimes it's not a mathematical statement. In other words, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a philosophy in some way. Psychologists often don't necessarily put their theories in, what are you, nature or nurture? Is your personality driven by your genes, how you were born, or by the sh shade of your neurons based on how you've grown up? That's not very easy to state mathematically, but it's a model that I'm going to think of a human being in terms of nature and nurture. Econometricians similarly have their own versions of models. Econometricians like using things like linear regressions because they understand coefficients. Today, econometricians are struggling with this, and there are wonderful econometricians, Susan Athey, Sandhya Milanathan, etc., who are saying, let me understand this. So these are business school professors who are spending sabbaticals in Google and Microsoft, saying, teach me about your world. Why are you guys doing regression differently from the way I was taught? And they're figuring this out. And now they're coming out with saying that, how can I do hypothesis testing with random forests? Now, that's not easy. For those of you who do lasso, for example, some of you may be using lasso and L1 penalization. Lasso automatically drops variables. How does it relate to the principle of picking a p-value less than 0.05 and dropping a variable? Are these the same things? Are they different? Which model connects the two pieces? So when we write papers or when we build theories, we build an abstraction. That abstraction is what we call a model. Depending on the kind of mathematician you are, you'll write a different kind of abstraction. It just so happens that people in deep learning and econometricians are different kinds of mathematicians. So they have different views into the world. But I hope I gave some examples to say that even in any applied problem, there are multiple kinds of models that you can think of. Your background and your training will determine what model you like. A kind of complicated to simple predictive model or a kind of simple to complicated prescriptive model, depending on what you want to do. Predict right 
or take a policy based on a parameter? What do you want to do? Complicated answer, but that's what a model is. It's, it's an expression of reality that you can do, build a theory or a procedure around. Right? Five minutes? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, hi, uh, this is Akshay. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, model building is a manual process as of now. So can it be automated? I don't think model building is a manual process. The need to build an automated model leads to things like deep neural networks. Deep neural network has to be automated. You can't sit in there and say that at 6.30 I'm going to change this and at 4.45 I'm going to change this. It's going to have to be an automated process given the complexity of it. So the challenge in machine learning is to say, number one, it is going to be automated. Right? Automated certainly runtime, maybe even automated in development. Because I can't keep building these models. You have to give me a, a platform to be able to do this. Whatever that platform is, Python, Julia, R, etc., it doesn't matter. But there has to be an automated development process and even an auto, certainly automated runtime process. So the question that machine learning people tend to ask is, what kind of a model can be automated? Which is where things like neural networks became very popular. Because it's relatively easy to automate them. One reason we use sigmoids, for example, is that the derivative of a sigmoid depends on the function itself. If f is a sigmoid, the f prime is f into 1 minus f. Which means what? Which means that you can dif when you differentiate, you don't need a fresh calculation. That's a feature of the model, but it allows for automation. So deep learning is, machine learning is built on the principle that a model should be, it should be made automatic. Many other fields are not. A social scientist would feel very disturbed by an automatic model. Because the social scientist's point is to say, I'm not interested in the model. I'm interested in figuring out what that model is telling me about society. And if you don't tell me what the little inside pieces are, I can't fix society. My purpose is not to say who is poor. My purpose is to make that poverty go away. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Yes. I, I mentioned it, and I, to me, deep learning is just a grown-up version. I mean, machine le deep learning is just a grown-up version of it. The way I see it, I mean, that's, it's a terminology. Deep learning is a particular terminology that's being used in order to explain certain kinds of machine learning models, as I understand it. But I could be completely wrong. The reason it's called deep is because of the, 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 the jump in the number of layers and the depth of the architecture that it goes to. It's also different. In other words, if, I, if you talk about a com convolution neural network, it's not the same layer that's repeating itself. You've got convolution layers, you've got pooling layers, you've got all kinds of layers. And the same thing for recurrent neural networks or LTSMs and various kinds of memory structures. So the depth is that way. Now, from a technical perspective, there are also what you might, you might think of as a broad neural network, which is a neural network that grows sideways. Traditional theory neural networks has tended to grow sideways. Which means that, for example, the fundamental theory of machine learning is what? A hypothesis is pack learnable if and only if the, its, dimension, its VC dimension is finite. That's a statement that talks about saying, if I have a sideways broad enough model, it's OK for me. Deep learning, I think, changed that paradigm to say, don't go this way. Go Deep. this way. And so, hence the difference. I, there are other speakers, and I need to stop, I think. Bye.